That Bruce is a kind boy, isn't he? <laughs> Glad that he had good words to say. <laughs> he knows other things about me, I guess. But I am glad to be here. Judy is with me, and uh, it's just, isn't it great to breathe some good West Virginia cool air? <laughs> That's what I miss most, especially in the summertime down there. It does get hot. <laughs> But uh, we are enjoying our living there. It's, uh, and the church there at Bevel Road in Daytona has put us to work. And uh, we are enjoying working with them. And I'm glad to be able to hear Bruce preach. And uh, even once in a while, get him back on track. <laughs> and he does that for me, too. <laughs> My subject today is uh, the fulfillment of prophecy from the last part of chapter 1. And uh, this is the prophecy of Zacharias concerning the work of his son, which would be the introduction of the Messiah to the world. Now, we remember Zacharias and Elizabeth old couple that had no children and I'm sure their hopes for a child by this time has been dashed and uh, I think that that's very much like the attitude of the people of Israel by this time who after uh, having the promise of Abraham 1900 years has passed the Messiah has not come and uh, uh, they are, I think, in the doldrums of um, domination by foreign governments, 600 years of foreign domination. And uh, now 400 silent years with no word from heaven directly to them. And so God's wonderful grace through the announcement of the angel to uh, Elizabeth tells them that they are going to have a child. That child would be a son. And uh, through the course of time, and uh, she brought forth that son and they named him John. Now the father when the angel announced the birth of John was not, uh, uh, he, he was not believing what the angel told him. And so he was, uh, he was stricken dumb. He could not speak. And so for that nine month period of time, uh, he, is, uh, he is dead silent. If he communicates, he has to do it with a, a, a board of some sort to uh, write whatever message he wanted to give. And so when the child was born and uh, at the circumcision, the, all the neighbors that were gathered there that were rejoicing at the birth of this child, they were uh, figuring that this baby would be born, uh, that, that he would be named Zacharias after his father. That was the common practice. But Mary, or, I'm sorry, Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. And so they, uh, they motioned to the father, what is his name going to be? And John took a tablet and wrote, John is his name. And that was the name that the angel had uh, communicated to Zacharias. And so that was the name of the child. Uh, news of these things spread abroad. And all of the neighbors and people, uh, even at distances, were wondering about this child that was to be born and what kind of a man that he would be. Now, Zacharias begins to talk about his son and praises the name of God. Now, I think I need to say a word or two about prophets and prophecy. Prophecy is everywhere in and throughout the Bible. 
Jesus said that the prophets were from Abel to Zacharias, A to Z. And uh, Jude says that Enoch, the seventh from Ab Adam, prophesied. And so prophecy was uh, not incidental. It was central to the scriptures. And from Genesis to Revelation, prophecy is a vital part of scripture. Prophecy is unique to true religion. So far as I know, there are no major religions that ever claim prophecy as one of their uh, foundation points. It's only in the Bible that we find prophecy. And it's only in the Bible that we find prophecy fulfilled. When human authors and writers try to attempt prophetic things, men like uh, Nostradamus or back uh, a few years ago, Gene Dixon, or some of the uh, persons nowadays, Hal Lindsey and others that try to prophesy and claim to prophesy. It's not long. In, in fact, I remember going to the uh, grocery store and, you know, the tabloids, there would be Jean Dixon's picture. And uh, she would be telling what's going to happen throughout the new year. Well, it's not long after those statements that uh, you find those prophecies disintegrating and uh, they do not get fulfilled and they are simply made out to be liars and fools. Only the Bible contains true prophecy and only God is the, uh, knows the future. Isaiah said, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Isaiah 46 and 9 and 10. And so the authority and authenticity and trustworthiness of the Bible is based upon prophecy. Jesus said, I have told you before it comes to pass, that when it does come to pass, you might believe. John 14 and verse 29. Fulfilled prophecy verifies the truthfulness of the prophet. Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 18 that when a prophet says something in uh, God's name, if it does not come to pass, then he is not a messenger of God, and you do not need to fear him. Prophecy is history written in advance. You'll remember in Daniel chapter 2, the image of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, uh, Daniel finally came forward and was the one that would, could interpret the prophecy. And he said, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. Daniel 4, or rather 2 and verse 45. Skeptics and modernists attack the Bible because of the accuracy of its prophecies. In the book of Daniel, chapter 11, uh, the prophecies are so pinpointed as to historic accuracy that, they're, that uh, the skeptics say, well, this couldn't be prophetic. The prophet couldn't have seen these things beforehand. Daniel in the uh, fifth century could not have written the things that are taking place in the uh, second century BC. But history has proved Daniel's prophecies to be accurate and very, very true. 
God, they, uh, someone has said that whether you believe God can predict the future or not depends on whether you spell God with a capital G. And so the, those who believe the Bible don't have any trouble accepting the fact that prophecy is from God. The prophets were spokesmen for God. Prophetic activity uh, was because the prophets had messages from God and would, uh, through inspiration, relay that message to the people. Jeremiah said, the prophet that has a dream, let him tell the dream. The prophet that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. That's a challenge to every gospel preacher, to every Bible class teacher. Those that have God's word need to teach it and preach it faithfully, or else you're not really being a servant and a messenger for God. God sent warnings by his prophets, rising up early and sending them, according to 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 15. It wasn't that the prophets came on the scene late, but rather that they were, God sent them early. And uh, thus Israel and Judah both would have time to divert their ways or change their ways and come to God in repentance and yet be saved. But they continued on their idolatrous, rebellious path. And so they went into captivity, scattered by the Assyrians, the northern kingdom, scattered them among the nations, Hosea chapter 9. And Jeremiah predicted that the southern kingdom of Judah would go into captivity to Babylon for 70 years. And both of these things came true. And so the prophets were the preachers of the Old Testament. And they preached against the sin and the rebellion and the chaos that was uh, being done in the nations of Israel and Judah because of sin. And uh, the, the future, but in the midst of their preaching on the social issues and the order of the day, there would be that launching out of into the future of a prophetic statement concerning the coming kingdom or the Messiah that was to come. And so you have such great statements like Zechariah talking about the, uh, the fountain of cleansing that would be opened in Jerusalem for sin and iniquity. Chapter 13 and verse 1. You have the, uh, the, the shepherd that uh, would, would uh, be, be sold into slavery. Um, well, pointing to Jesus and the statement or the, uh, the uh, betrayal of Judas. And he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. When the Messiah came, wrongs would be righted, sins would be forgiven, and men would seek the Lord. And so of such a time as this, Zacharias prophesies. I'll read for, uh, from our text. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, we, uh, his holy prophets who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all those who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. 
the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. This is his prophecy concerning the coming Messiah. And uh, he, he speaks um, as if um, these things have already taken place. In sacred writing, this is referred to as the prophetic perfect. It is as if the event, it, it, the event is stated in such a way that uh, it is described as something that has already happened. It's already taken place. And so the work of the Messiah was such that uh, it was sure, it was certain, as the kingdom that Daniel prophesied, uh, that it would come to pass and it was certain to happen. The spirit of prophecy had ceased with Malachi. But now, after 400 years of silence, it is given again. Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit, and in a strain of sacred rapture, he prophesied the coming Messiah. With the, uh, the text says that Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. Here is an example of a holy man of God uh, being moved, carried about by the Holy Spirit, as Peter says in first, uh, 2 Peter 1 and verse 21. It will be remembered that Elizabeth also prophesied. When Mary came to see her in the sixth month of her pregnancy, when she came in, the babe, it says, leaped in her womb. And Mary made two observations that she would not be able to know except by the Spirit of God. Number one, she, she said that Mary would be the mother of her Lord. How would she know that? How would she know what Mary's baby would be? And she said that the babe in Mary's womb was Elizabeth's Lord. Mary is the mother of the Lord. And the baby is going to be the Lord. And so two things that she prophesied and spoke by inspiration. Being filled with the Spirit does not mean that a person is always under divine influence. That everything they think, say, and do is going to be uh, inspired by the Spirit of God. It may be that the events surrounding the birth of John recorded in this first chapter of Luke was the only time in their lives that Zacharias and Elizabeth ever miraculously in, were influenced by the Holy Spirit. And so this was an occasion when the Spirit came upon Elizabeth, and an occasion when the Spirit came upon Zacharias, and they prophesied. And so it was the working of the will of the Spirit in their lives, and not the will of themselves bringing on the Spirit. It was the Spirit that dominated them, not their will, that brought the Spirit. Zacharias prophesied. In what sense were his words prophecy? First, it was a proclamation of the truth. It's a message from God to the people. The prophets were preachers. Prophecy is God's message preached by the prophet. Second, the message to Zacharias is predictive. 
Zacharias foretells what was to come regarding Christ and then of his son, the one who would prepare the way for the Christ. And so he began to speak. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. It is very worthy to note the fact that Zacharias said, God has visited us. If it were not for the intervention of heaven, there would be no plan of salvation. If it had not been God looking down on fallen sinful man, there would have been no savior. There would have been no saved people. And so it was because of heaven in mercy and grace looking down and seeing the plight of man that God sent his son into the world. Luke records the God of Israel has visited us. And so we spell it G-R-A-C-E in capital letters with an exclamation point. That's God's grace. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. <coughs> Word horn here is a metonymy for strength and power. And it's used in that way in several passages in the Old Testament. And, and so the horn here that is uh, raised up is, uh, is referring to Christ. Bullinger's um, Figures of Speech book says uh, uh, this refers to Christ as being strong and powerful and able to procure and bring salvation. The horn of salvation. Zacharias speaks of the holy prophets have, that have been since the world began. And as we have pointed out before, Zach, uh, prophecy is continuous throughout the Bible. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19 and verse 10. And so from Genesis to Malachi, and then from Matthew to Revelation, we have the spirit of prophecy. As far as the Old Testament is current, concerned, Jesus said, the law and the Psalms and the prophets spoke of me. Isaiah said, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. The horn that God would raise up is the deliverer, the one that uh, uh, would overcome their enemies and save them uh, from the hand of those that hate us. But it was not freedom from political and foreign enemies. The zealots of Jesus' time sought to raise up an army to rebel against the Romans. But it was, and it was not that the Messiah would root out the Romans and rid the land of foreign powers. But he was to save them from their religious enemies. Jesus' work was not that of fighting the politics and politicians of this world. It was to rid the land of the power and influence of the devil and those that were his minions and did his bidding in the flesh. 
The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, Paul says, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. Christ found corruption in Israel's rulers and religious leaders. Their judges and scribes and lawyers and priests and high priests and condemn them severely. Read especially Matthew 23. But Zechariah praised God as the one who had kept his promise. And uh, uh, the promise of our, to our fathers and remembered his holy covenant which he swore to our father Abraham. The terminal end of the Abrahamic promise is in Christ. Jesus is the one through whom uh, in your seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Genesis 12 and verse 3. God made a promise and after 1900 years he has brought it to pass with the advent of his only begotten son. The son sealed it with his blood. When we gather around the table on the first day of the week and drink of the cup, we are speaking again of the blood of the covenant that was shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26 and verse 28. The ultimate aim of God's work of redemption was that we might serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness before Him all the days of our life. In the Old Testament book of Daniel chapter 3, we have Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, I think probably better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're Babylonian names. But uh, these three men were facing certain death because they would not bow down to the image that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. And so at the sound of the music, they were to bow down, and anyone that did not bow down was to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Those three men said, Our God is able to save us. And they confessed that they believed that He will save us. But then they added, but if he does not save us, if it is not, not God's will that we not be saved, we are still not going to bow down to your image, O King. That's the kind of resolve that God's people have got to have in every age. This is the resolve that we need to have in our day and time. That whatever faces us, we are not going to bow down, we are not going to yield, we are not going to, ye uh, to submit ourselves to government <laughs> policies and government people that want us to disobey the God of heaven. Stephen and Paul and Peter and all the apostles served without fear. They believed the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Hebrews 13 and verse 6. Holiness and righteousness characterize those who have submitted in humble obedience to the Lord Christ. Peter said, you are a chosen Gen chosen race, New King James, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. And I hope that all of my students recognize that that is from Hosea chapter 1 and 2. You were not a people, 
but now you are the people of God. Zechariah's prophecy then uh, concludes with uh, the role of his son, John. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Verses 76 and 77 of chapter 1. Notice he does not speak of his child by name. He doesn't even say, my child or my son. But he is so fully absorbed in the mighty work that the child will do in the preparing of the way of the Messiah that he just simply says what he is to do. Jesus praised John as the greatest of prophets. He said that John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah is the prototype of the prophets, it seems. He appeared there on the Mount of Transfiguration with uh, Moses and Jesus. And so John was raised in the desert area and lived off of the land and ate locusts and wild honey. He was clothed in rough clothing. His work was the subject of the prophets of old. Malachi said, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord. Malachi 3.1 Isaiah speaks of the voice crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Isaiah 40 verses 3 through 5. He did not literally pave highways. He is talking about the hearts and minds of men. Those that were high would be brought low. Those that were low would be raised up. He would clear out the filth and the debris that would clutter the way of the Lord. And so when Jesus came, John had prepared a people for the Lord. The work of John was to give knowledge and salvation to his people. It began by convicting men of sin. He said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized of him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children unto Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Luke 3, 7 through 9. Brother H. Leo Bowles said, John awakened in the people a conception of their need of a spiritual emancipation and of the necessity of repentance and reformation of life and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It is not the standard of living, nor political freedom, nor civil rights, nor economic parity, or anything else which distinguishes the salvation of God. It is the forgiveness of sins that distinguishes it from any political system, for none 
can save except the Lord. All of God's work, Zechariah said, stems from God's mercy. And I'm at the conclusion. If God had not intervened in history, there would be no salvation, no lifting up to make us better. Nothing more could be done because man would be on his own if God had not intervened. Man is incapable of being better and finding salvation without God's help. Jeremiah said, It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. Zacharias spoke of Christ as the day spring from on high. Peter also speaks of the day spring. He says, We also have the prophetic word made more sure, which you do well to heed, as a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. 2 Peter 1 and verse 19. Jesus spoke of himself as the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 8 and verse 12. And finally, Zechariah said the work of uh, the Messiah and the work of John was to guide us into the way of peace. There is a phrase used by the prophets a few times in the Old Testament. Isaiah 2 and verse 4. Uh, Every man shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. That's simply saying the age of the Messiah will be a time when men can rest in assurance of their salvation and be comforted with the peace of God. I pray that you will find your vine and that you have your fig tree where you can sit and contemplate the goodness of God and the love and mercy and tenderness of His Son. A great prophecy of Zacharias. Thank you.